this week on Drive Every Ferrari, we have a very special Ferrari 360 Modena. One that I've been obsessed with ever since I heard about it four years ago. As you can see, it's in blue posi, that's dark blue to you and me. It's got red leather and yes, it's a manual. In short, it's a bit of me this. In fact, so excited was I when I heard about this car that I made the current owner a promise. If he was ever gonna sell it, I would be the buyer. And so this week on The Car Guys, I am diving deep into the 360 Modena. We're gonna be discovering how it was improved on the 355, the history of the V8 bloodline, the 360's quirky features, its design, and its significance in Ferrari's history. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. So let's do this. Launched in the 1999 Geneva Motor Show, the 360 Modena replaced the 355 and swiftly became the highest selling Ferrari in the company's history. It lasted five years until 2004 when it was replaced by the 430. The 360 was a clean sheet new design. The project was overseen by Maurizio Manfredini, Ferrari's former chief of experimental, who later went on to oversee all of Ferrari's V12 cars. It was the first Ferrari to be constructed entirely out of aluminium, which meant it was a hundred kilograms lighter than the 355, and it helped the car lap the Fiorano test track three seconds faster. The aluminium monocoque chassis means that the 360 is 40% stiffer than the 355, a particular dividend for the Spider, and it was also 28% lighter, which means that it was faster and more fuel efficient. You could get the 360 in manual or F1 electro hydraulic gearbox, and no prizes for guessing which one is more prized today. The design language was a radical departure from the truly beautiful F355 and could be best described as swoopy. If you were being cruel though, you might call it a goppy frog, but that distinctive face was created due to the radiators being mounted ahead of the front wheels. The swoopy design also has real aerodynamic purpose with over 5,400 hours in the wind tunnel and it means a great deal of the airflow was directed to its entirely flat underside, as seen here. This was carried over from the race car development. At 180 miles an hour, there is 180 kilograms of downforce and the steering naturally weights up due to downforce rather than electrical assistance. But it is true to say that the design was controversial at the time of launch and it suffered unfair comparison with the prettier F355 by those that didn't understand how airflow was beginning to shape modern supercars. As such, values of 360s were in the doldrums for many years and it therefore became the most affordable modern Ferrari. But those low values meant owner maintenance neglect and the world is awash with ropey examples. However, in the last five years, appreciation for the 360 has increased and it's actually aging extremely well. And it's now being recognized by collectors for perhaps the first time, especially with the all important manual gearbox. At the time it was launched, I remember being not even vaguely interested in the 360, but that's all changed now. Remember that this is also the generation that brought us the magnificent Challenge Stradale, perhaps the greatest stance and engine noise of any Ferrari road car. And a little known variant of the 360 is the one-off 360 Barchetta, gifted to Ferrari CEO Luco di Montezumolo for his wedding. It was chassis number 1220. Just look at it. What a magnificent thing. So let's have a gander at the exterior of the 360. And as I've already said, I think it's been aging particularly well. What was once featureless is now refined and elegant. Certainly when you compare it to modern metal, which has taken F1 style vents, grills and active aerodynamics to the max, to the detriment of the purity of the design. And here it is, I mean, look, 
look how beautiful this car is. That dark blue that you can see there is called Blue Posy. It is a very dark flat blue that looks almost purple in bright sunlight, but then when the sun goes away, it looks jet black. It's a historic color. It's one of my personal favorites. I've considered it for some modern cars, but it never quite sat right. But on this 360, it looks epic. I am so much in love with this color. And then when you contrast it with that red Bordeaux leather inside, this car has become my favorite 360 ever. I am absolutely in love with it. I think it really suits this dark tone, but this just blows my mind. It is every bit as special as I hoped it would be. But when I'm standing here, the combination of the blue and the red, I can't tell you, I am absolutely fizzing with excitement to be near this car. It is believed that this is the only blue potsy car in the UK. I don't know how many there are worldwide, but it's not gonna be many, but this color combination is so 60s 250 Lusso to me. It's really classy. And as you can see, the car is in perfect condition. It's well-maintained, the paintwork is good, the interior is good. I'll take you through that in a second. We'll look at the interior in detail, but I just think it's such a lovely, simple shape. And then you clothe it like this, and wow, this is a great day for Drive Every Ferrari, and it's a great day for me. A manual 360 in exactly the right color combination. It's done 20,000 miles, so not too much. It's a 2,000 car. Oh, I can't wait to drive it. I literally cannot wait to drive it. What comes across immediately when you're standing next to a 360 is just how simple the design is. It's a very one-line piece of drawing, and it all tucks around to this compact rear. You've got two sets of headlights. You've got two sets of exhausts, and that's it. It doesn't need to be festooned with extra grills. The wing mirrors are quite dangerous. You can see that it was a complete revolution to the 355. It's utterly different in every way. At the time, people thought it was bulbous. They felt that the bodywork flopped over the wheels. They felt it was a bit ungainly. But actually here today, knowing everything that we know about what's happened to Ferrari since and Ferrari design, I think it's beautiful. I think this is a superb looking car. And as a toss up between the 430 and the 360, I think I'd go 360. Many 70s and 80s Ferraris were defined by prominent side air intakes. Think Testarossa and 328. But thanks to the repositioning of the radiators and a focus on airflow, the 360 makes do with quite subtle vents on the rear wings evoking the look of the 250 LM. You've also got lower vents just here, just ahead of the rear wheels. And this has very much been the trend until the present day, right up to the current 296 GTB. The pop-up headlights of the F355 were ditched in favor of these integrated units to improve the car's drag coefficient and make it slippery through the air. They're obviously though, not as cool as pop-up headlights because let's face it, Nothing is. We've also got this for the first time on a road going Ferrari, a glass window to the engine bay. What a fantastic idea. Now you get to see this 3.6 litre 90 degree V8 in all its glory. Those red crackle rocker covers, all that gleaming metalwork, and of course, the viewing window from the driver's seat. The Tipo F131B 360 engine was derived from the 355, increasing displacement to 3.6 litres and featuring titanium alloy con rods and fly-by-wire throttle. As you can see, it's a longitudinally naturally aspirated V8 dry sump five valves per cylinder L engine, giving you 400 brake horsepower at eight and a half thousand revs and generating 275 foot-pounds of torque, which is 373 newton-meters. 0-60, 
4.5 seconds for the manual, a few tenths quicker for the F1, and it goes on to a top speed of as near as makes no difference, 185 miles an hour. Now remember there is no twin clutch gearbox until the 458, so the 360 has a hydraulically activated six speed gearbox with manual or automatic modes. So now it's time to take you through the interior of this car and what a special interior it is. <laughs> wow. Now red and blue is not a common color combination. Many people would say that they jar and clash, but actually if it's the right color red, like this Bordeaux leather and the right color blue, it works perfectly. It becomes super classy. It is greater than the sum of its parts. I was a little bit worried actually that it was going to be too bright a red in here, but I'm happy to report it isn't. It is perfect. It's a clarity Bordeauxy red. It's a deeper red. Just look at the way it sits perfectly with this dark navy blue interior. The upper dashboard isn't black, it's a variation of blue leather to make it more harmonious, more sympathetic with the rest of it. If it was too dark, it would be too much. But this color, which is very much similar to a sort of blue scuro that you can get today, it just works. Honestly, it just works. Now I should of course say a big thank you to Richard, who is a friend of the car guys and the owner of this car. I've known Richard for about five years and I am extremely, envious of his collection. I should also apologize to you viewers because as you may have noticed, I'm a little bit more husky than normal. That is mainly due to a really sore throat, but of course I'm not going to let that get in the way of drive every Ferrari. Now let me calm down for a little bit. Rest, take a deep breath. Just take you through the cabin itself. But you've got red extending all around the top of the cabin, the whole area around the viewing window to the engine, the seats obviously, the leather around the handbrake, the basing of these little trays, inside the door cards as well, and the lower part of the dashboard. It's just fabulous. I cannot emphasize how super, super cool this color work is. So this center area here, we've got the climate control buttons, proper flicky turny knobs, which are obviously very easy to use. You don't have to take your eyes off the road to use them, which is exactly what you want in a supercar. You don't want to have to be searching for controls or trying to press horrible touch screens. You just need to drop your hand down, feel the shape of the twisty knob and get the desired result. It's a more sophisticated tool for a more elegant age. Now the interior is slightly larger than the 355. You also got for the first time this big bench behind the seats here. As you can see, it allows you to actually fit some golf clubs in there. It's that big. Now Ferrari has used aluminium to remind you that it's an all new aluminium car. So this entire center console here is aluminium. So is this, so is the surround for the instruments and so are the bottom of the door cards. That works quite well actually with the other materials. You've got a proper manual handbrake, obviously. You've got a ashtray, obviously. And you've got the controls down here for the electric mirrors and for the parking light and hazard warning lights. And you also have the familiar sticky buttons. That's right, this one hasn't been done yet, but like all Ferraris from the 90s and the 2000s, eventually certain plastics in the car start to get very tacky and you need to get those sent away and treated. So the mirror buttons, the electric window buttons, the ashtray, and the actual door openers are all very sticky in this car. You've got a manual opening and lockable glove box here. And when you grip the steering wheel, you will notice that it is A, very simple, just like the 430. In fact, even more so because you don't have a Manatino yet. So this steering wheel has only two things on it, a horn and the Ferrari badge. And I have to say, it's a wonderful, small, perfectly shaped item. 
When I look through the steering wheel, I can see the instrument cluster. Mm -hmm. And we've got the central rev counter, which of course also has the window that if you have an F1 car displays the gear, but if you have a manual car, it displays nothing. You've got the digital fuel display down in the bottom right, the speedometer over to the right as well, which is showing 20,000 miles. And over to the left, we've obviously got the uh, engine temperature gauge, we've got the oil temperature, and we've got the oil pressure. Either side of the steering wheel, we've got stalks, which are no doubt sourced from the Fiat's part bin. And you've got your headlights on the left-hand side and windscreen wipers on the right. To my right, just like in the Challenge Stradale, I've got four little buttons here. One to turn off the traction control, one for heated mirrors, one for fog lights, and one to change between sport and normal suspension. But of course, the main talking point of this 360 and one that singles it out as one of the best is the manual gearbox. And because it's sat on this aluminium throne, your hand just falls naturally to it. It is perfectly positioned for a sporty driving. And if I put my foot on the clutch, oh yeah. Oh, it is. it has quite the sweetest action of any Ferrari manual box. It is perfect. I can obviously see out through the back to that wonderful engine. So that makes this the greatest seat in the house. And overall, it feels small, compact, and focused towards the driver. Everything I need to drive quickly is right to hand. I don't need to take my eyes off the road. I can just enjoy it. And it makes me want this car even more. Mm, this could be an expensive day. So one thing that fools a lot of people in this car is trying to find the release for the front bonnet and also for the fuel filler. It's not in the normal places. It's actually under a little metal flap next to the handbrake right here. There you go. Two secret buttons inside the cabin. But you didn't know that, did you? But what should we do now? Yes, that's right, viewers. It's time to take it for a drive. So this is it then, the first drive in the 360 Modena for me. I've never driven a normal 360 before. Of course, I had a Challenge Stradale, uh, but they are quite different. Steering, surprisingly similar. The way the car moves, surprisingly similar, but in pretty much every other regard, very, very different. So I'm intrigued to see how this beautiful manual 360 behaves on the road. I know the 430 was a genuine surprise, a pleasant one. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that developed over this. So main things to highlight about the driving experience of the 360. Steering is light, gearbox very light once it's warmed up. The clutch pedal, again, pretty easy to use. There's no great Lamborghini Countach-esque slab that you have to push down. Everything is very fingertippy and very manageable, which is exactly what you want on a Ferrari that you could use every day. As well as looking super Italiano Classico, these seats are very comfortable. Visibility is good. I've got, of course, that huge rear window looking out over the engine, but the wing mirrors are good. They're not enormous, but they're quite a nice size to be able to see what you need to. Front visibility is excellent and actually very few blind spots. The biggest area probably of concern as you join, say, a motorway is that the C pillar and the sort of extra strengthening around the engine uh, does give you a bit of a blind spot right back there. And brakes, although nowhere near as good as the Challenge Stradale ceramics. Still pretty good. They give you confidence. They've got a nice pedal feel. And the steering is just fantastic. It really does make you realize that modern Ferrari steering racks are just nothing in comparison to these old ones. I think probably late 90s, mid 2000s is a real perfect spot 
for incredible steering on Ferraris, but this, this is great. Just from the first few meters down the road, I have confidence. It just feels light in my hand, but with enough weight to know that I can feel everything that's going on with the road. I can feel every undulation, every camber, everything I run over, I've got immediate tingles to my fingertips. I'll tell you what though, the real benefit of Drive Every Ferrari is perspective. You get to drive all the generations of cars. And one thing that's immediately apparent to me is that the jump between the 360 and the 430 is not that great. This feels extremely similar. There is no great area of this car that I can see that was massively improved in the 430. The driving position is the same. Throttle response, engine noise, it's all very similar. The dials are very clear, they're easy to read. Everything just falls to hand naturally. I'm loving the position of the manual gearbox. That really does work well. So we're in fourth there. There you go. Quick blip on the throttle, quick change down. Seamless, beautiful. It just makes you feel connected to the car. But one thing I haven't noticed in this car so far is air conditioning. I'm not sure it's got air conditioning, which is a shame, especially as it's 30 degrees outside. Throttle response is instant, as you'd expect from a naturally aspirated V8. You just point the car towards the horizon, put your foot down, oh, ho, 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 and away we go. Oh my God. I'm just transported. It's like I'm driving through the Italian hills. What an experience this is. You really need to get inside these Ferraris to understand the passion and the heritage and just the raw emotions that they conjure up as you drive them. Every drive is an event. It's not a fire spitting monster, this 360, but it's got a pleasing, sporty, gruff noise. <laughs> Well, now we're alone in the car, viewers, I should perhaps tell you the tale behind this car, why I am driving this particular car for Drive Every Ferrari. I was on a supercar driver trip to Scotland, and I happened to meet a chap, and he mentioned one drunken night that he had a 360, a manual 360, a manual 360 with blue posy paint and a red leather interior and I said tell me more because frankly it sounded like the most incredible car that I'd ever heard of it was hidden away it was in a very unique spec and I vowed at that moment and actually told him to his face numerous times that if he ever planned to sell his car that I was the buyer and that's what spurred me on for this I remember that car before today I've never seen this car in the flesh. I've never even seen photos. But I knew this had to be the 360 Modena that I drove for Drive Every Ferrari because it's got a special story behind it. And who knows, at some point in the future, maybe I can prize the keys from Richard's hands and maybe one day she will be mine. Now we've got the temperatures up, the fluids are nice and hot, so we can start pressing on and see whether this car goes as well as it looks. So I think it's time now for some beans. Ready? It's so good. Oh, now do you see what I mean by a fruity, sporty exhaust? Oh yeah. So as you can tell, it picked up its skirts and it galloped pretty convincingly. Considering this is a 22 year old car, well, that was impressive. Second gear, ready? Immediate response. Oh. 
if you need a bit of winky visage, it's here, it's on tap. And then you hit the corners and everything becomes very fingertippy. Really nice. Oh, this sounds fantastic. Goodness me. If I hadn't lost my voice before, I will have done by the end of driving this. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. Yes, yes, yes. This is a cheeky little number. Is it going to keep up with a GT3 RS driven hard? No. Is it going to put a big smile on your face? Yes. Yes, it is. Well, I'm happy to report that this car is a little honey. Honestly, it looks incredible. It's so stylish. And the driving experience, yes, it's got it. It's got it all. If ever there was a car that deserves to be in the car guy's garage, this is it, my friends. This is it. It might not be the fastest thing in the world, 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds, 185 miles an hour top speed but it's the whole experience but as a simple do anything everyday Ferrari the 360 really was fantastic the 355 whilst a phenomenal car always felt a little bit fragile and sometimes could feel a little bit out of tune but the 360 not only was it lighter but they really seem to sort a lot of the reliability issues. These were a lot more reliable, they're a little bit more bomb-proof, and as a consequence, they make the perfect first Ferrari, as Sam from Seen Through Glass can testify. It ain't half getting hot in here, I can tell you that. So what do I like about the 360? Well, I think the shape has aged really well. I think it's a good looking car. It's very simple. It's pretty reliable. I like the modest power that you get from it. It's a good old shove. It sounds good. The steering is excellent. In this example, the manual gearbox is fantastic. And obviously for this car specifically, it's the spec. It's all about the spec. It's all about the blue paintwork and the red leather interior. It's also pretty practical, the boot is good, and one of the critical things about the 360 is because it has been in the doldrums for so long, it's pretty affordable. It is a relatively cheap Ferrari, and if you buy well, and you buy one with good history, you are gonna have a very reliable Ferrari. What do I not like about the 360? Well, to be honest, there's not a lot that I don't like. I think the brakes feel a little bit uh, underpowered. The biggest difference actually that I can tell between the 430 and the 360 is that this is a little bit more floaty on the rear end. It does feel a bit unstable at speed and heavy cornering. I do get the feeling that you could probably swap ends quite easily with this car. 430 was a lot more tied down, gave you more confidence in the corners. But I have to say, considering the 360 is claimed by many to be the runt of the Ferrari litter, and one of those cars that just doesn't really excite you at all, I have to say, I think that's It's got the perfect amount of flair and capability. It feels like you could use it. It feels not intimidating in the slightest. And I think it's still got quite a decent amount of curb appeal. The trouble with modern Ferraris is they try too hard. They desperately want your attention. They just want you to look at them all the time. Oh, look at me, look at me, I'm a supercar. But with this, it's a bit more subtle. It's a bit more like that 456, very subtle car. The 612, very subtle car. This is in that category. And in a world with far too many show-offs, it's nice to go subtle for a change. And then it does that. It reminds you that it is a Ferrari. <laughs> and with
with sweat dripping off my smiling face, it's back to the studio. A quick history of the Ferrari mid-engined V8 then. It all started in 1973 with the Dino 308 GT4, a 2 plus 2 car demanded by Ferrari's owners Fiat in an attempt to boost the company's modest profits with a more powerful and expensive new model to sit below the V12s. The 2.9 litre V8 engine was the perfect successor to the increasingly outclassed Ferrari V6s. It was compact, had a strong power to weight ratio and therefore gave greater on-road performance. It also allowed Ferrari to charge more for it. Behold, the V8 mid-engined Ferrari was born and the 308 GT4 lasted until 1980. But no one could guess just how important and special the V8 would become for Ferrari. In 1975, the game-changing 308 GTB Vetro Racina was launched at the Paris Salon. This two-seater mid-engined V8 was designed by Leonardo Fioravanti, who also created the Daytona, and early cars had glass fibre bodies, and this was changed to steel in June 1977 to allow for the introduction of the open-top GTS model. 1980 saw a smaller engined 208 GTB and GTS made specifically for the Italian market to allow for exploitation of a tax loophole. And 1980 also saw the launch of the Mondial 8 and the Mondial Cabriolet, two new transverse V8 mid-engined 2 plus 2s, the natural successors to the 308 GT4. Ferrari needed something more potent to win back customers, so it introduced the 308 GTB and GTS Quattro Vavolve QV models in 1982. They lasted three years and helped ensure the 308 was Ferrari's most popular ever car. And the 308 formed the basis of one of the most rare and exciting modern V8 Ferraris, the 2.9-litre twin-turbocharged, fire-breathing Group B-derived GTO, produced in 1984 and 1985. Just 272 were made, but it still makes Ferrari lovers go weak at the knees even today. With an engine increase to 3.2 litres in 1985, Ferrari unleashed the new, chunkier 328 in both GTB and GTS forms. And once again, it had a bestseller on its hands. People just couldn't get enough of them. Even today, the 328 is highly prized and well regarded among Ferrari aficionados. 1989 saw the announcement of the rakish successor to the 328, the 348 TB and TS, a 3.4 litre V8 with 300 brake horsepower and a beautiful Pininfarina body inspired by the Testarossa. Ferrari began experimenting with other variants and special editions of the 348, and 1993 saw the full-on 348 Spider and also the 348 GT Competizione, a highly prized beast. But 1994 really saw the Ferrari V8 ascend to dizzying heights with the ridiculously beautiful five valves per cylinder screaming 355, one of the highest points in Ferrari's modern history. Whether it was in Berlinetta, GTS or Spider form, the 355 was an instant sales success thanks to the introduction of the F1 paddle shift gearbox option, and the 355 is a must for any car guy collection. Five years later, the bulbous 360 Modena replaced the 355 as the company's V8 flagship, with a 3.6-litre engine putting out 400 brake horsepower. The zenith of this engine was the Challenge Stradale Special Edition in 2003, one of the finest Ferrari sounds ever made. Thank you for watching The Car Guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode on this quite phenomenal manual 360 Modena. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you kept it entertained. I hope you enjoyed the history and all the details of the car. If you like what we're doing on The Car Guys, please subscribe, leave comments and likes. There'll be another episode next week. Beep.